speaker today is Dr. Peter Eden. He's president of Landmark College. Uh, you may have noticed um, uh, that Marty sent along his CV along with this uh, Zoom invitation. He will be talking about the challenges that smaller colleges are facing, not only in the economy that we were having, but in the, uh, in the overall new economy that we're facing. Um, you will see from his CV um, that Landmark is under very capable leadership. Dr. Eden. Thank you, Marcy. Can you all see me? Yes. Great. Um, I, I think what, I, what I'll do is provide a little bit of background on the college. I don't want to assume that everyone here on the, on the call in the meeting knows uh, Landmark College. So I'm going to provide a little bit of a background. And, and as Marcy said, I'll, I'll try to tie in the, the original topic of two months ago, which is some of the, the, the business model pressures of a small, of a, of a, let's say, of a college or university, especially in New England, with the sudden existential threat of coronavirus and a recession on the business models. Um, but I'm mostly interested in, in, in the Q&A part regarding uh, how Landmark is getting through this and how we aim to move forward. So the college is a comparatively young, started in 1985 and started uh, as a college for an associate degree granting college for students with learning based, uh, rather language based LD like dyslexia. And over the years, uh, um, I believe that parents and students sought out Landmark College because they believe the model would be good due to their learning challenges associated with attention deficit disorder. Um, and of course it would because of the, the small class sizes and the um, extraordinary amount of resources we have, but mostly the fact that at the college to this day, it's a dedicated model. It's not a program. Students are not in a program. Every single student learns differently and we know that. So over the decades, we had students with dyslexia and ADHD, and, and I know for a fact that we've always, like every college, we've always had students with autism, whether the term is Asperger's or autism spectrum disorder or whatever, college-capable students on the spectrum. Um, anything which interferes with learning, which we refer to as being neurodiverse. So these neurodivergent students, um, they have lots of strengths, but they have some challenges when it comes to learning in conventional ways. So again, the thing that makes us different is that we only enroll students that have some learning difference. That's it. And once students get to the college, they realize they never have to worry about getting the right calculus professor or if people will treat them like they were treated in high school. Because again, it's not a program. It's baked into the cake of our entire curriculum. Um, We've always been a small college, or when I'm trying to sell the college during open house, I say we're optimally sized, but we have about 400 full-time residential students, and that's pretty small uh, for, for uh, institutions. And uh, uh, our small size, much like our mission, our brand and identity, can be a double-edged sword. Um, by that, I mean this place, as you heard Mara say, absolutely changes lives. We see it all the time. However, not every young person with an LD wants to go to a special ed type of college. They don't like the label. They thought they were done with special ed by the time they got out of high school. So in terms of our brand and our identity and our sales, um, we have to be aware that while many students are really into it, now it's our first choice, others transfer there because they need more support and they didn't think they'd have to. So I've always been very much aware of that. And we've tried to mainstream in many ways by offering now we have bachelor's degree programs, of course, study abroad, uh, discovery research, internships, um, athletics. We have everything you'd find at any other college, just like Endicott College, Whitley. Um, 
And of course, at, at Endicott, there's students with LD as well. I know that for a fact. Um, but we know that we're a specialty college. We know that. So we, what we have to do is we have to get parents and students to visit us. And as soon as they visit us and they see all the other cool students, and they realize this place is not built on a deficit. It's built on the understanding that people learn differently. They're wired differently. And if given the right environment, they can succeed and excel. So that's what Landmark is you know, all about. Now, as you know, a lot of colleges have closed in Vermont. A lot of small colleges have closed um, and others are going to close. You've seen the news, you, you, I'm sure you follow this. Um, there are some variables that are common when you have a college closure. Um, what happens really is, uh, and let me back up a little bit. I don't believe that any college university was built around the notion of efficiencies. I don't think that institutions are built or were built to be efficient. They're built to be places where students could learn and develop and make mistakes and ask questions and grow on many, many levels, but they weren't always built around efficiencies. So decades later, when there's a, there's a challenge with enrollment, those efficiencies manifest in the business model with lost revenue and operating budget deficits. So when your college faces an operating budget deficit, you say to yourself, oh my gosh, we need more students. How can we attract more students? Well, one of the easiest ways to attract more students is to give them more scholarship. And they don't really give any scholarship. Like buying a car, they reduce the price that they charge the person. It's called a discount rate. So in order to deal with the fact that there may be a financial problem, by getting more students, they often have to give out more scholarship, which is a great thing, a really great thing. But what that means is every student they bring in, these colleges actually net less revenue. Now, they're not the only college doing this that is offering more scholarship and discount to students because all the other colleges in the New England are doing the same thing. So the next year they raise their scholarship more. And then one day they wake up with a 70% discount rate where they don't realize 70% of the tuition and fees that they need to run the institution. Then you get to a point where you realize if I'm only netting 30% of the revenue, there's only one way to get to actually make enough money to run the college. That's by getting more students and then they cannot get any more students. This is exacerbated by the fact of during the great recession of 2008, many families stopped their plans to have a kid, to have a baby because of concerns about employment. That has meant a demographic we already see, which is a decrease in the number of high school graduates, especially in the Northeast, is only going to get worse in the next five years, which will be about 18 years out from 2008, when a lot of people stopped having babies. So there's this nadir coming. So all of these things affect the business model of a college. And what happens is the accrediting body takes a look at their reality that they can't balance their budget. And they look at another thing called the endowment. Of course, the endowment is the money in the bank, which is supposed to keep the college going in perpetuity. A lot of the colleges that closed have very small endowments, like maybe $3 million. If a college starts to run deficits in the of a couple of million dollars a year and they only have a three million dollar endowment the accrediting body will say wait a minute you want to accept all of these students as first year students with a promise of delivering a bachelor's degree to them in four or five years if you continue to run a deficit you will have no more money 
and you will not be able to deliver that degree. And the accrediting body then gets involved with the accreditation. And once the accreditation is imperiled, it's almost impossible to retain and recruit students. This is some of the stuff that's happened to some of the other great colleges in the state. Wonderful places. They too change lives. But the enrollment challenge in the competition to enroll students by giving out more and more scholarship when you don't really have that money to give, resulting in a high discount rate, and then a poke in the eye by the accrediting body. That's why a lot of colleges are going out or have gone out of business. Landmark College has a small endowment. It's about $24 million, small by Middlebury standards or any other one in the hundreds of millions or a billion. But $24 million is not $3 million, obviously. And we intentionally keep our discount rate around 30%. Now, we are not to be applauded for that because what that means is we are unable to give out enough money for a lot of needy families to afford us, which hurts us. Although at least 75% of our families, almost 80% get aid from us so we can help them. But we've resisted the urge to raise our discount rate in order to grab those last 10 students. We've also resisted the urge, which has happened at other places, I hope not at Endicott Whitley, which is to decrease your selectivity and start accepting students who are really not a good fit. Now we could turn the spigot on and bring in, we're, Landmark is a lot more selective than you might think. We only accept about 60, 50, 60% of the applicants. We could turn the spigot on and bring in another 10 students, but we won't do it if they're not right for the school. So we've done this, which sounds virtuous and meritorious, but what it's resulted for us the last five years, with the exception of this year, as of a few months ago, is we've had enrollment challenges too. So we've weathered them. We've weathered them and we've invested in outward facing programs so we can serve students elsewhere. Students who, for whatever reason, will not come to an expensive nonprofit, we don't make any money off of this, expensive rural small college in Vermont. They want to stay home in California. We've developed seven years ago online programming for students with LD, learning differences. We have college courses we provide to high school students across the nation to earn college credit. It's called dual enrollment, and it's related to what Ron was saying about face-to-face -face dual enrollment. But we have a burgeoning online program only for neurodivergent students. We engineer the courses differently. We have a, in, a professor who knows about learning differences. We have an advisor who el also helps them online. And the courses are built around the, the reality that students have executive function, organizational challenges, and learning differences. Now, is that generating enough revenue to save us during this tough time, you know, the last few years? No, but it's ready to go big. It's ready to go big and start to enroll many, many more students, and ideally students with LD in high school who may thought they'll never go to college because they, they have an LD. So we're going to be able to change thousands of lives, and hopefully that generates enough revenue for the college, Landmark College, through good times and bad times, to stay just the way it is. Now, then coronavirus comes. So the gradual... I won't say the gradual challenges and pressures to the buzz business models of all of these small colleges has suddenly been extremely accelerated. Almost every college I know has sent students home for the spring semester because it's unsafe to have them on a college campus. And you know the old saying, a dormitory, not an old saying, you know the new saying, the dormitory is like a cruise ship. You know, they're, they can be pretty risky places for infectious disease with, one, with, a, with an organism like this one. Um, 
That means almost every college is refunding what the families paid in room and board. For Landmark, that's about a million dollars that needs to be refunded. Sure, we can apply some of it to next year for students coming back, but it still affects our fiscal year and our, and our numbers for this year in terms of revenue. For some other bigger colleges, it's in the millions of dollars that they hadn't budgeted for. So they suddenly have to pay back room and board, and that's the right thing to do. Students are not there living in the dorm rooms. They're not eating with their meal plan. They should get their money back. But this is going to, I think, cripple a lot of schools. Um, at Landmark, we at Landmark, we're small. We are replete with resources, meaning we have about 200 faculty and staff for 400 students. That does not mean we infantilize the students and hold them by the hand. It means we have small class sizes, a lot of support, a lot of academic support, a lot of student life support, because it's kind of a learning living program. These are all smart college capable students, um, but they have an LD. And um, it's an expensive model to run. Um, but because of the model, because of the fact that we have so many resources and it's a uh, tightly run program, we stand a much better chance than most to be able to manage student safety, whether it's the flu every year, which is serious, or any other risk. Nevertheless, we also told the majority of our students that they can't come back to campus after spring break. That was about a month ago. We did allow, like almost every other college, a handful of students, for us 26 students that have true hardship, to stay on campus. Um, and the rest of the students are at home learning online. And uh, Whitley, maybe during our Q&A, you can tell me how it's going with the Endicott online program. Now, um, learning online, even though the Landmark College has this really important growing online program reaching out, especially for younger students looking for college credit, that's not what our parents are paying for. They're paying for Landmark College residential program so that the students can get stronger in every dimension. So I know that. Um, it's, it's very challenging. The students want to come back. And we want to have the students back. We've had no COVID-19 cases. Um, I believe firmly that we could bring back some students for summer programs very carefully. And I believe that if we can build in online and hybrid, that is online face-to-face, -face, in smaller groups and ways to manage students to de-risk it for us. And I believe we need to do that in the summer to show the faculty and staff that students are not radioactive. They are not vectors of infectious disease. They're humans like everybody else. And if they practice good, you know, I won't say social distancing because that's the wrong term, physical distancing. Socially, they still need to connect somehow, but physical distancing. Then we can bring some back this summer on a very small basis, we hope. And hopefully that leads us to the fall where we can have students come back and we can manage them. We may need to have them self-isolate the first two weeks back on campus. It depends on what the regulations are. As you know, we're trying to plan for summer and fall when I like to say this saying, it's like, it's like knowing half a telephone number. It doesn't do you any good. We don't know what the guidelines will be next month, let alone September. So we have to plan for multiple scenarios. But there's one thing, the students want to come back to campus. They need to come back to campus, but we must ensure safety. So we're looking at lots of ways to deliver our program in ensuring safety. And that's taking all of our time right now. We're also planning for a pretty big decrease in enrollment in the fall, not because we can't bring them back, won't bring them back, but even if it is safe, because Vermont's comparatively safe, we may have families just saying, I don't wanna take the risk with my kid living in the dormitory. It, it could be that. So we have to prepare for a very, very difficult year coming up in terms of our business model. But as I said, we don't have a $3 million endowment. We have a tiny endowment, but it is 24 million and we could absorb a year or two. 
So that's really what Landmark College is, some of the pressures leading to college closures, and now this acute existential problem, which is coronavirus, and I think equally bad, a possible recession where parents cannot afford a private school like Landmark. And you're gonna see other colleges go out of business. Landmark's aim is to not go out of business, but we might need to change a little. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Peter. We do have uh, a few minutes. If people have questions, um, you might try typing them in the chat box or waving and try to find you. Or, or just Whitley. <laughs> Whitley, don't forget to unmute. Okay, I'm unmuted. Um, so I was just gonna ask, you talked about your internship program, um, like just briefly, but we have, as you know, an internship program at Endicott. Um, and one of the things that I've been talking about a lot with my advisors and just like my friends and stuff is how difficult it's gonna be to um, get a job once this is all over because a lot of places won't be hiring or if they are there it's going to be a surplus in like healthcare and grocery stores um so i don't know i just wondered what if you've heard any feedback from any of your students if they're like the seniors if they're concerned about like steps after yeah whitley um first of all what year what's your what's your major and what year are you so I'm a senior and um, my major is marketing communications. So um, like my graduation is canceled and I am, I'm not, it's the most difficult part is not um, being at home and figuring out how to do work. I've pretty much gotten that taken care of after four years, but it's um, difficult to not be at school with my friends and you know, that kind of thing, transitioning into being yeah. a full adult, I guess you could say. <laughs> well, um, yeah, well, as you know, uh, you know, Endicott doesn't just have an internship program. It's the entire brand and mission is built around experiential learning. And, um, and that's one of the main reasons why you probably went there. Now, um, I, it, the, my seniors, the baccalaureate graduates, they're scared to death, of course, not only uh, is the job market going to be worse? But they also, especially the ones who have autism, who understand they may, you know, they, they're not always faced with someone hiring them who gets it, who understands that autistic people, uh, you know, have many, many strengths. So they have that concern as well. Now, you, you do know, I think, and I'm not just trying to make you feel better, you, you have an advantage that you do have that internship um, experience. Um, but it, it very well could be a difficult first year coming out of college because of the sheer realities. Um, so, um, you know, this is one of the reasons why I mentioned the Great Recession of 2008. Um, a lot of people realized I'm not gonna get a job where I want to, paying what I want, so I'm gonna go to graduate school. You'll probably see a lot of people saying, well, I was thinking about getting an MBA or, or going to grad school, and I might as well do it because I'm not convinced I'm gonna get that job yet. So that'll be an option for some, some graduates, obviously. Um, uh, it's, uh, there's no solution for this, Whitley. This is a huge, as you know, multifactorial problem with our economy and our society right now. Um, things do turn around after a while, and there's always a job for someone who wants to work hard. You do have an advantage with your internships, and don't be afraid to, um, you know, try to find a job somewhere, anywhere, because as people look back, and, and you try to get a job that's related to your field, even if you have to work elsewhere for a couple of years, everybody's going to know what these years were about. When, when people look back at college transcripts or employment, they're going to know that, oh, that was the year after coronavirus and things were just crazy. So my students are just like you, Whitley. They're like, good grief, it was tough enough already, then this has to happen. Hang in there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I think we have time for one more question. And I, I, Mara had a question. Uh, hi, Peter. Um, so <clears throat> there are a couple of us in the Rotary Club who also happen to be on the Marlboro College Board. So this question is coming from an area of deep concern. 
Uh, the statistic that really opened my eyes about what's facing New England residential colleges versus other colleges, and there are many, many, many factors, is the fact that the average first generation college student doesn't travel any more than 50 miles away to a residential college. Um, and those are just the kids who are going to a residential college, not the ones who are, are going to be um, commuters. And that the average college student in America only travels 100 miles. And we live in an area of declining demographics all over New England. So how, how do we as New Englanders like have like a hidden advocacy for our colleges in terms of getting the word out across the country, um, particularly for Landmark College because you have a very specific demographic. How can we help you get word out? Because I'm already living with enough anxiety about being on the board that shut down Marlboro. Yeah. Like, First hand knowing what your college has done, this would yeah. be a disaster for our country yeah. if Landmark went down. Yeah. Well, you know, as you know, Mara, the deck is stacked against us. This, the, the, the public sentiment against, um, you know, private colleges is one thing. Um, actually, higher education um, is under, has been under attack for years as whether it's worth it or not. Um, and I, people talk about debt, college debt. It's, it's extraordinary in many cases. But I will tell you something, and I'm not defending this, but the average college debt, the average college debt is about the price of a new Toyota Camry. That's the average college debt, and don't let anybody tell you anything differently. And unlike a Toyota Camry, no one can ever take your college degree away from you for the rest of your life. It's still the best investment, but people are attacking higher ed, privates as well. Mara, what we have to do is we have to survive through this demographic apocalypse. The best way to do this, and this is crude, but you have to fish where the fish are, and they're not in New England. That's why we are branching out with our online programming. We're going to start a micro campus in the Bay Area of San Francisco because they understand neurodiversity. They might even romanticize it, which I don't like, you know, that autistic people are geniuses and all that stuff. But we are going to start small micro campuses and deliver a transition to college programs for students with LD in the Bay Area, probably the Southwest, because the Southwest has the only growing demographic not the Southwest. It has a big demographic that's elsewhere, the Hispanic demographic. That's one of the few growing demographics. We need to be in that space, Mara. We have to be in that space. And I don't care if Landmark has only 300 students, as long as it stays and it endures. And then after we get through this demographic crunch, then we can stabilize again. The reality though is we can't grow out of this without triggering the discount rate or the selectivity and spiraling and all the things you know about um, and you went through with that with, with Marlboro, which is a wonderful college. We have to just raise money, focus on quality, and find the revenue elsewhere. That's the only solution. And that's what we're going to do. Unfortunately, others are going to close. You heard about the Vermont State Colleges. Now, they had problems way before coronavirus. That's the the straw that broke the camel's back. But we, we don't want, it bugs me that Vermont is getting such a black eye and losing so many schools because it's such a wonderful place to study and learn and live. Um, but this is, this is just what happens when, when you have an industry, uh, and then suddenly the customers go away or they won't buy your product. I'm sorry to sound crass. And you're, and you're pressured and you can't make it anymore. Um, but we're going to be as inventive as we can at Landmark, and, uh, and, that, and that means we're going to go and we're going to serve people elsewhere. And we're just going to try to survive in Putney and never go away. But we're not, we're not thinking about growing in Putney, just surviving. We're going to grow elsewhere, but we're never going to leave Putney. Well, thank you, Peter. Um, this is uh, officially this is when we're ending our meeting. But Peter, if you are able to stay, if people have some questions uh we're we'll leave the meeting open for a bit um so we can continue the chat if, if peter's available um but otherwise um i will adjourn the official part of the meeting and we'll see you next week thank you all thank you thank you peter thank you, thank you. bye so if you do have questions please um uh either unmute yourself and, and jump in or type it in the chat box
Well, Peter, if you need anybody, like if there's a parent or an auntie or somebody who wants the, let, let me give you somebody firsthand who saw a life being changed, who doesn't work for us. You can give them my number. All right, Mara, we need it. It's, it's very important. I, you saw my little sales pitch there. I can't stop myself. It's when, it's when the students in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the parents or the relatives of a student, it's when they say something, that's what resonates. Because that's not a BS sales pitch from the guy who runs the place that they're always afraid of. It's a real thing. So Mara, we could, we could need you. I, I also want to talk with you about Wolf Khan at some point. Um, okay. Mara, maybe next week, why don't we email each other? I, I got a couple of questions about Wolf Khan. Um, in his, <laughs> in, you know, I'd love to talk with you. Anytime. Hey, Whit Whitley, Anytime. Whitley, don't be afraid to email me at petereden at landmark.edu, okay? Because I, I know your dean and I know others in your major. And um, I would just love, love to tell them that I had the chance to meet you on Zoom and everything, okay? <laughs> Thank you. Is um are you do you know Dean Hallerstein? Laurel? Yeah. Yeah, I know her. She's actually tell my, she's tell my her I said hi. I know her. <laughs> Thank you. I have a question. <clears throat> hi, my name is Lisa, and I've just finished my first year at Antioch in the clinical mental health counseling program. Excellent. And maybe this isn't the place. I don't want you to feel in any way ambushed by this question. But Landmark was actually the first place that I reached out to for a practicum and internship because I high, hold it in such high regard. Um, and I conversed with several people and I was told that you've retired your practicum internship, um, which was a... Um, saddened me. I'm a, I've lived in Brattleboro for 16 years. I have a master's degree in education. Yeah. Um, I would be a great fit, I feel. I'm not interviewing now, don't worry. But I know that extenuating times... <laughs> you a good times, job, you are. <laughs> okay. Well, what I was going to say is that I know that extenuating times do call for creative, innovative right. measures. Yeah. And notwithstanding... Um, HIPAA and all the different KCRAP accreditations, which yeah. I understand, I would think you would really want to welcome volunteers, particularly within the school system. So, yeah, yeah. So, I, I don't. Do you know when the practicum was was abandoned? Generally, roughly. I wasn't given that information, and just so you know, it was also abandoned at the Putney School, and it seems like there's a trend. But just as a uh, doctor has to go through a residency procedure, you don't want to feel like you're encroaching upon people's time, but this is how it goes. We have well, to go through the practical internship yeah. process. Yeah, well, we're like any b business or, or college where, you know, we, we wish we were in a less rural area because we could really use postdocs and interns and all that stuff. Um, and I, but I don't want to speculate. I don't want to say it happened before my time, although I think it happened before my time. And I don't want to talk about the dynamics of the, of the office. The best thing to do to get an accurate, intelligent response is for you to send me a message. Okay. It, you can send me a message. Uh, you know, you could look me up. Call me at, you know, 387-6725 or peterreden at landmark.edu. If you communicate with me, I can then ask the right people without revealing this, the source of the question. And it could be that this was a phenomenon that was driven by whatever factors. And these days with a new lens, we might have a need. So why don't, you just, why don't we just communicate? And if it's not possible, at least I can tell you why. Right now, I don't know. Thank you much i really appreciate oh, yeah. that thank you so much right hey peter uh hi, hi how are you i just wanted to um echo what mara said i'm happy to offer any um testimonial i um hired a landmark graduate william and he's extraordinary and not only is he wonderful but the support we've gotten from landmark is really highly unusual and just incredible and it's made it so that we, our staff can be educated because um, he has some differences and, you know, we're totally open to that. And he has okay. become a cherished member of our team. He's just, he's absolutely yeah. delightful. And I don't think it could have happened if we hadn't had the support from Landmark um, oh. that was, was just, you know, 
unusual and continual and any question we had, boom, it was answered. So wow. I'm more than happy to, to, to trump your praises. Wow. Uh, Meg, I, I, it must be difficult to be the sibling of a super, of a superstar like Andy <laughs> and, you know, overshadowed by a, a superstar sibling. I can, I can relate to that. Uh, yeah, Andy is, is absolutely fantastic. Too. But listen, all, the, most of the credit goes to you, Meg, and I'm not just throwing roses at you. You know, places and people that understand neurodiversity, it's not a deficit, but it's also doesn't mean you're an automatic genius. You know, there are challenges. And for you to hire William, as you know William now, you see his affect. And you yes. know that most people are going to say, oh, what's this? He's got autism, but he's funny as hell. He's smart. He, I'll bet you he's reliable. And oh, yeah. Um, on. yeah, he's... These people just need a chance in the world. Our drive-through uh, approach to the world, people don't give others a minute to before they judge them. Um, but you are fantastic, Meg, and I'm glad your company is so successful. I, I, but we need to do more together. You know, you know as a college. Yeah, and, and we're let's do it. Let's and, talk. And that would be great. Let's Wonderful. talk. Peter, I'd like to jump in here. Um, back when I was uh, practicing and uh, landmark college students would come in, I would always take extra time and bring them back to the office and just ask them, you know, I'd say, tell me about what landmark is doing for you and, and what makes the difference. And each and every one just felt like they'd been found. It was just <laughs> incredible. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate that. You know, if the, the, the bizarre thing about Landmark is we're simultaneously unique and just like every other place. You know, we, we are a college. And so the students do college stuff, meaning they're not always well behaved. Think about college, everybody. And, you know, um, yet on top of that, they have less confidence maybe because of their LD and the challenges they've had. And sometimes they look for the cracks to fall into. But when they come to this place, they realize whoa, wait a minute, these other kids are all cool. I, you know, I'm, this isn't the special ed resource room. This is just a college that's way ahead of its time. The problem for me is it's $70,000 a year. Very few people pay that, but it's 70000 for me to run the place. Um, and it has a special ed brand. And a lot of young people want to get away from that. That's the challenge. Your greatest strength is your greatest weakness. And over time, neurodiversity, in the notion of being non-neurotypical, I think we'll have less of a stigma. And much like Catholic universities, people in the future will look, I'm gonna send my kid to a neurodiversity-based college. I just, I just, that's where we send our kids. That will happen over time. It might take 10 years, but when that happens, we need to be the best when people start naturally looking for that type of college. So that's, that's our sense, is that it's going to come around. But, Marcy, appreciate it so much. Any other questions before I get off and struggle with my children trying to learn online today? Peter, I have one question. Are you looking at an international um, population as well? Can you do distance learning internationally, yeah. and would that be a benefit? Uh, well, the big challenge, Meg, the reason why we haven't been uh, – we have international students already, but the reason why we don't – that's funny, I'm smiling because a lot of colleges are going to go under now because they relied on those 20% of international students who now can't travel here. That's how Wyndham College went under, you know, our campus. Right. They went under in 75 because of just that. But that's not why we haven't gone there. We've got, we haven't gone there because we haven't had the money. We haven't conquered the domestic market. And if there's a language barrier on top of a learning difficulty, we're in trouble. And a lot of cultures will never admit to a, a learning disability. For, for cultural reasons. That said, um, Canada, maybe not international, but they've got a big LD population. Other English speaking places, um, we would love for them to come here, but now that we have an online program, which is so strong, um, we're gonna be able to send things there and soften the ground. And maybe that will be you know, ipso facto marketing. Thank you. Well, thanks again, Peter. This was a, a great discussion. I'm glad you were able to stay a few extra minutes. Yeah. No problem. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Bye. Have a good thanks, day. Peter. See Bye. Ya. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.